come. This is Lucy, who is a very fearful dog, and uh, she has a really bad case of separation anxiety. In this video, I'm gonna go over some tips that you can use if you have a dog that has separation anxiety, as well as my method of fixing it. So I see, you see she's finally interested. She got some treats here. Okay, so she probably, I'm probably just gonna pantomime this in the video and we'll work on this afterwards. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and keep, we'll work and keep filming so you can watch this later on. Okay. So uh, first thing when it comes uh, to dogs with separation anxiety, I'm gonna move my knees because if I stay like this forever, I'm old, I won't be able to like, walk later. So uh, separation anxiety is essentially a panic attack that the dog goes into when left alone. Some dogs need to be with anyone. Some dogs with separation anxiety, with separation anxiety have to be with one specific person. Now she's a rescue dog. She's only been here for a, uh, about six months? Three months. Three months. And so her guardian, uh, she spent most of her life in a kennel early on. And so she's really fearful of the kennel and she will escape any kennel. Now I can show the guardian how to keep her in there, but the guardian has come up with a solution where she just has free reign in the house and she doesn't destroy things. But it's still not healthy for her to be in that panic state. So separation anxiety is uh, basically something that dogs see coming a mile away. We go through, we have uh, rituals that we do before we leave for work. We put on a work uniform or certain clothes. We sit in a certain chair and put our clothes on. We put, I put makeup on, um, I'm on TV occasionally. Uh, but uh, we grab our keys, we grab our sunglasses, we grab our phone, we grab our briefcase. We grab, you know, all these different things. The dog recognizes us doing those in a certain, not only a certain action, but the order of doing them. And so basically when you have a dog that has separation anxiety, what we wanna do is break the association. So right now, oh, she put those shoes on. She only put those shoes on. She's about to leave. Oh, she put, she grabbed, she grabbed that. She, oh, she grabbed her keys. She grabbed her phone. She, oh my God. And the dog starts working itself up long before you actually, leave. by the time you actually leave, the dog's already worked itself into a frenzy. So what you want to do, uh, the guardian here already knows this, but in case somebody else is watching, you don't want to make a big production when you come or go. When you come home, if the dog's excited, just ignore it. Wait for it to calm down. When it calms down, reach to pet. And then I'm going to start wiggling, pull your arm back and continue doing your thing. You might have like five, 10, 20 attempts before the dog realizes when I get up and get excited, that stops you from petting me. That's that, that excitement level is too high. And when dogs have separation anxiety, it's essentially they, they're, they're ping ponging from one extreme to the other. We want them to kind of be in the middle. So we don't want us coming or going to be a very excitable or a dramatic event. So when we come home, just wait for the dog to calm down on its own. Don't tell it to do it. When it does, we start trying to pet. When it starts getting excited, we pull back and go on our, our day. This is really operant conditioning. And after enough repetition, the dog will learn, when I'm calm, I'm very attractive to my human. So I'm excited, I become invisible. Well, if my goal is to get your attention, I'm gonna do the thing that gets the attention, which is to be nice and calm, and then she pets me right away. Um, all right, so um, we wanna identify what those triggers are and systematically deprogram or desensitize the dog to them. So picking up the keys is a big one. So for a lot of us, we as soon as the dog hears our specific sound of the keys, and you can't see her because she's behind the camera where your ears just went up and she her head sat. So what you want to do is go where your keys are, pick them up, and then put them down and walk away and do something else. Uh, you get up on, at the time you normally get up for, I know this kind of sucks, I really like sleeping in, but get at the time you normally get up for work on the weekends. Get up, shower, go through your ritual, and then after the shower, get to, go lie back in bed. Or, you know, get dressed, and then you'll lie back in bed. Um, it's not all necessarily, we're not doing all of them in concert. At first, we just want to pick up the keys, put them down, and then go walk away, go to the bathroom, come back, pick up the keys, walk them down. It's a numbers game. So you want to do this over and over until you pick up the keys, and I was like, mm, well, big whoop. It doesn't associate you leaving. So after a while, you know, so make a list of all the things when you're getting ready for your work, kind of keep your phone out or keep a pad of paper. As soon as you see the dog kind of pacing, licking its lips, perking up, paying attention to you during things, those probably what we call triggers. Those are some triggers that are associated with you leaving. So you want to make sure that you manage and, and engage with those behaviors as often as you can, independent of you leaving. So once that's the first stage is so the dog doesn't recognize that we're leaving. And when we do cut, when we leave, don't be like, you'll be okay, buddy, you hang in there. I'm going to go to work. We should be like, you little ingrate, you got to sit home and sleep for 10 hours. Why are you going to bring home the bacon? So we're not, I mean, obviously being a little facetious, but uh, it's the dogs are usually going to sleep most of the time that we're gone. So don't feel bad when you're leaving. Now, fortunately we haven't put her in, uh, the guardian here is not putting her in a kennel. Uh, and a quick note on this, any dog, whether it's an adult, puppy or whatever, if they're in a kennel for longer than four hours, it will release cortisol, the stress hormone, into their blood. Now it's a physical manifestation as well as psychological. 
I've had clients whose dogs literally are breaking teeth trying to get out of kennel. I know a couple of dogs that have passed because they get caught, kind of what you saw in one of the pictures that Guardian showed me. So fortunately, we're not using this. We have it here. And a little trick for this is I would probably pull out, well, the color of your dog blanket is not ideal. I, dogs are colorblind, so I like everything to be a light color. So if I leave a dog treat right here, it's kind of hard for you to see with the camera. But if I leave it right here, you can see it because it's on white. So I would get like a white bed liner that you can put in there. And I wouldn't put all, a whole bunch of other stuff. The leash, is she also fearful of the leash? She loves her leash. She loves her leash. Okay, so the garden's trying to create positivity. So what I would do for that, what we do um, in our puppy classes, is we actually have everything out of the kennel. We have just the white floor. We close the kennel door and we show the dog doing these delicious treats. And we start dropping the treats into the kennel with the door closed. Well, shoot, that's the opposite. Normally I want to get out of the kennel. Now I kind of want to go in there. There's good treats. So what we do is we, we uh, grab a fiber and we wait for the dog to start pawing at it. And then when it does, we open the kennel and we come up with a new command word. Every time the dog licks up the treat, we say palace or mansion or beach or whatever the word is. And then I get to go and get them up and then it runs out. And the next step is I just throw the treats in and out until the dog goes in and out and it starts lingering in there. Anytime the dog's out uh, doing bathroom, well, the guardian here has to kind of go out with her. But if you have a friend or somebody, leave a treat in there. Anytime she gets a new bully stick or a new toy or anything, that's where she should find it. A lot of times I'll take a bully stick and I'll drill a hole through the end of it and I'll zip it to the bottom of the kennel, one of those bars. So the only place I can eat this is in there. So what we're looking for the dog to do is go in there and practice having good things happen. Now the guardian here is not that worried about it. A lot of people use, uh, watch my videos for other, uh, other people that haven't met you. So I'm trying to make it as, incomplete as, as complete as possible. So the idea is we want to take away the stigma so that's no longer a negative. The dog actually goes in there and hangs out there on, her, on their own. Uh, now, in her case, you're probably not going to need it, but just for, uh, so you know. Okay, so basically, um, the way that I have found to help dogs get over separation anxiety is, the reason dogs panic is they're going through the biggest gulf that there possibly is. There's no bigger range than from one, zero to 100, if you're on a 100% scale. That's the biggest extreme. And that's what we do. We're home with the dog, we're at 100%. Then we leave and we go to 0%. There is nothing in between. So the guardian here, I already asked, a lot of my clients kind of look at me like I'm a little funny, um, if the dog follows them in the bathroom when they go to the bathroom, because a lot of the people we do, well then the dog doesn't have any practice on being alone. So we have to factor and build this in. And a great way that I find to do that is teaching the dog to stay. Now I teach the stay in what I call the three Ds. Most people try to do it as three times as hard as it needs to be. Stay, and they take a step back. Stay, and take another step back. Stay. Well, I'm saying stay, 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 which is not a true stay. And now I'm doing distance and duration and distractions all at the same time, three times harder than it needs to. So I'm gonna pantomime, I'm gonna pretend my bag here is an invisible dog, or is a, is, we're a pretend dog because she's on the couch and she doesn't really engage with me. But we'll do this off camera with you so that you can kind of go through it. So what I like to do is I like to be engaging in the dog. So I like to be at the dog's level. The dog doesn't have to sit, but I usually try to put him in a sit or an LAY. Now, if, they prefer, if you're starting to sit and they go to an LAY, then just start at an LAY. Um, and the book says that the dog just has to stay in the location. Now, I do this professionally, so for my dogs, if I put you in a sit-stay, I want you to stay in a sit. If, uh, but technically, if the dog's sitting and then lays down and then gets up but stays in the area, that still is one sit, one stay, excuse me, as long as they don't try to move away. So uh, my puppy quest, I'd spend one week of doing one second stays. We think it's super duper easy to stay when I just stay there. So it's like, but wait, I smell the treats. Why are you not giving them to me? What do you want? You want to shake? You want me to dance? You want me to lay down? You want me to... So they go through what I call their bag of tricks. So the first D is duration. We want the dog just to practice for duration only until they can stay for three to somewhere between three to five minutes with you right here. So if this is the dog, I'm going to, first of all, I have all the treats in one hand. I'm going to have more treats in my hand than I plan on practicing. Now you also need to have a release and a stay word. Stay is pretty ubiquitous. I have four dogs and each one of my dog has its own unique command word to release. Release, break, freedom, and parole. I like fun command words. So this way I can have, I can say stay, and I can say parole and just max comes. So it becomes more powerful if you do it that way. So you want to, whatever your, your release command, I'm gonna show you here in a second. So basically I'm gonna have a treat in between my thumb and forefinger like this. I'm gonna either have it at my, hand, my side or behind my back if the dog is really targeting that hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a stop sign. I'm going to give, I always like to give a, a, a hand signal as well as the verbal. Dogs usually learn from the hand gesture first, then the verbal comes later. 
So when the dog, I wait for the dog to look at me and I say, stay. Now, if you look at my hand right now, it's halfway distance between my face and the back. Most, if this is the dog's face, this is where most people say, stay. Stay. Well, I don't want to have a hand in my face. So punctuate it halfway distance. And when you get to the end, say, stay. Then pull your hand back to your breast, count to one, then deliver the treat like this. So the treat is going into the dog's mouth and here my hand is also in the stay position. So it becomes associated together. So I want you to think of each stay as a cycle. There's a start to the cycle and an end to the cycle. Then you have a decision to make. Are we practicing again or are we done? So I'm gonna show you three, I'm gonna do a two, five, two, four and six seconds stay and I'll show you the release. So I have the hand at the treat ready, stay, one, two, and I'm only counting out loud for the video. You should count your head and always count all the durations we use a stopwatch. All right, so let me start again. Stay, one, two, stay. That ended the cycle. Now I start a new cycle. Stay, one, two, three, four, stay to complete that cycle. Then I started the last one. Stay, one, two, three, four, five, six, stay. And remember, the treat goes in the mouth first, then they hear the command word. Then I'm, I'm ready to release the dog. I go like this. The dog's looking at it. I throw a treat there. The dog takes has to take at least one step away to get it. When it licks it up, I would say the word release, break, freedom, parole, whatever the word is you want to use, holiday, vacation. There's no right or wrong word. So the reason we throw that treat is to get the dog moving away. So that puts in context moving away. Stay is also in context, but the dog doesn't understand it because I'm, I'm just sitting here. And like I said, if your dog gets up or starts pawing at you or doing other things, back up. So if I go stay and I go one, two, and at three, the dog gets up, I didn't know where I'm at the count. And next time I would say, I wouldn't pay for that because he didn't do the job I wanted. I'd say stay and maybe one second, stay. And there's nothing like I said, I do with one, my own personal dog for one week. Stay, stay, stay. And a lot of people, what the mistake they make is they, they don't have a start and stop for each one. They'll say stay. And then now this is when you'd be ending it. You say stay and you're rewarding it. But that's the end of the cycle, but think that, that that just put the dog in a stay again, and then they start counting. So it's stay to start it, stay to stop it. Eventually, once the dog has it, we're gonna say stay to start it, the end is the release word. But during training, we want a whole lot of repetitions. Now for dog training, you wanna keep your training sessions to about 90 seconds or less. Well, this one, we're gonna go beyond that. We're gonna go up to like three to five minutes. But at first, try to keep it really short, one second, two, three, four, five, and if you, again, you might get stuck in the one second for a while, but eventually you start elongating it. And if you get frustrated or the dog gets frustrated, make sure you stop before that's the case. The dog will sense if you're frustrated and will remember, that'll be the last most fresh memory engram it'll have. And be like, I don't want to practice that stay. You got mad last time we did that. So you want to be very calm and relaxed and comforting. And after the exercise, spend a couple minutes rubbing her belly, Play, chase around the house, go for a walk, do something she really likes. So it's like, oh man, we did this. I got a lot of treats. I sat there. I feel good about myself. I'm earning these treats. And then we get a little adventure afterwards. So I, I had some fun. So that's the first stage is uh, just keep on practicing this. Now, uh, just for a stay for duration only, don't put any distance whatsoever until you get at least three minutes, five practice times in a row. So you can say stay and wait for five minutes before you treat and do that five times in a row without her getting up. Only then are you ready to go start doing distance. Now for distance, I'm gonna move around a little bit. So basically, let's say that that's the dog in a stay. Oh, one last little thing for the stay. I don't know why I'm getting down. I usually do it so I'm next to the dog, but I don't have to in this case. Don't practice in just one location. Dogs don't generalize well. They have to do things in a whole lot of permeations. So do this in, in here, in your kitchen, in your living room, your, in your mudroom, all over the place. Also make sure you're not doing it while somebody's doing something that's distracting for the dog. So if somebody's eating popcorn or a wrapper is crackling, that's gonna cause the dog to lose some attention. That's distraction, which is the third D. All right, so now I've put the dog in, uh, you know, we're, we've achieved the three minutes, so I say, I'm ready to start doing distance. So now I say stay, pull my hand back, and I take one step back. I count to two, because I took one step, I'm multiplying the number of steps. Then I come back, stay. Remember, two hands always for each delivery. Then I start again, stay, and I probably go back and count to one, or uh, count to two again. I do this two or three times until the dog seems to be okay, because when you start moving away, a lot of dogs will come towards you right away. So if you have to, if you have that happen, do a couple stays for duration first, and then stay, take one step back, and then come back, boom, stay. 
And at first it might not be really a delay. You're just kind of rocking back and forth with the dog staying there. And eventually you get to the one second consistently, then you can go to two. I usually go by one second intervals until I can get to 10 seconds. So I'm walking away, one step, one, two, treat. Then uh, the next time I went one step, one, two, three, stay. So do that and you can, pay. I'm giving you really specific, but you can kind of play around with the elements. If the dog gets up and moves away, it's what we call an auto release. That it's a failure, it should not get paid, and then you should be counting in your head and backed up to whatever that interval is before that you had a success. Back maybe one or two seconds behind that, perhaps a couple times, and then work your way back up to where the dog failed before. So the idea is eventually we're gonna to get to the point where we can be up to 15 feet away. Now when we, we're doing 15 feet away, we're gonna use my bag here again as a demonstration. So let's say I say stay and the dog's 10 feet, 15 feet away over there. I back up and there's a wall here. So the dog can't see once I move past this wall. So now I'm at 15 feet and the dog can stay there consistently. When I get to 15, it's so like 14, 15, I'm gonna move out of the dog's sight for one second and then come all the way back and give it the treat. When you move out of sight, that's really difficult for the dog to do. So what you do, you kind of find a position where the dog can be, on, you know, can't see you, but it, and I would probably not move towards your door because the dog is separating anxiety, um, but it's just out of sight for a fraction of a second and come back and then practice that a couple times and then try to make it one second before you come back. One other little tip that I forgot to go over the first one for duration, don't lock eye contact with your dog the whole time. So if I'm like at like 10 seconds, I would say stay. Check around, look, you know, you pull out your phone and look at some things, then deliver the treat. If you lock eye contact, the first time you break eye contact, the dog will come and find you. So we're preparing the dog. What we're doing for the stay is we're helping the dog practice somewhere between zero and 100. Now we have to get to the point where we start moving away before we can start using it that way. So once you can get to the point at 15 steps away, that's when you start moving out of sight. And again, you're gonna play around with the duration until you get to the point where you can be out of sight for a couple minutes. Now at this point, I want you to start using the stay in your day-to-day -day life. You're sitting here watching TV. You wanna go get a drink of water? Lucy, stay, get up, go get yourself a drink of water, come back. Lucy, release, throw the tree down to the side. So the idea is she can still see you, but you're farther away. So there's somewhere between 100 and zero. Now eventually you're gonna say stay and you're gonna go upstairs or wherever it is. But the idea is to be so progressive in your steps that the dog doesn't even realize that it's going longer and longer. Now when I'm doing just for duration, one other little tip for that, don't always go like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Sometimes like when I get to like a minute and a half, I might throw in, okay, stay, count to a minute and a half, give the dog a treat. Next time I'm gonna say stay, 10 seconds and give it, every once in a while I'll throw an easy one in there. So it's, it's not, oh man, you're always asking for more criteria. But eventually we get to the point where you're 15 feet away and longer than a couple minutes, I want you to make me very methodical about it. So first I just get up and go get a glass of water, then I come back. Then I go make a sandwich and I get back. And then eventually I'm going to the bathroom and closing the door. And eventually I'm going to change clothes. I'm going to the garage and checking things. But these, each one of these should be very small. And you have a security camera, so you can actually watch your dog on the phone when you actually leave. Your dog gets up, you have to know where you're at your count-wise and practice again previous to that. So a lot of times I find having a, a, a smartwatch or a smartphone, starting a timer, once you get to the point where it's a minute, you don't be counting over and over, you, you get distracted and lose it. So you always look at your watch, okay, uh, 37 seconds. So you need to back up and practice at 33, 34, something like that. Eventually you get to the point where you can, uh, eventually you would add in distractions. Distraction would be have somebody eating the chips or crack with a crinkly wrapper while you're practicing this. But that's not that important for this. We just want to get to the point where we can have the dog stay while we leave and go outside of the dog's line of sight. Eventually we'd like to get to the point where you can put the dog into a stay, come in here and watch TV for like a half an hour and then go and release the dog from the different room. Now these are all just to help the dog practice being calm while it's not in your immediate presence and gradually lengthen it. So now when we actually leave, we're not gonna put our dog gonna stay because then they would auto release. What we're gonna do is we're just preparing and helping them practice being calm. If a dog practices pacing around being anxious when you're gone, that's what you're practicing, anxiety. So the whole point of this is the dog is very calm because you're not actually leaving the house. It's somewhere between zero and 100. Now, once the dog, we can get to the point where, and the longest you would ever have to practice for any exercise for a dog is two hours. Once a dog can do something for two hours, you never have to practice beyond two hours. I don't think that you're gonna have to go to two hours. That'd be very long. 
But you want to go to the point where you can put the dog in a stay and watch a TV program for about a half an hour or longer and the dog stays there and it's calm and in the same spot. And again, you can watch and shoot again. So the next stage is now that we've prepared and helped in our practice, and this is probably the case of a course of over, uh, depending on how often you practice, uh, a month or two. Now when you're practicing, I usually recommend practicing about 50 stays a day. And the way to do that is to count out 50 of these pieces. I'm actually tearing these pieces in half with a smaller dog and putting them in a plastic bag or a ramekin. By the end of the day, make sure it's empty. That'll help you stay on track to how many repetitions you want to do. Uh, but it's a lot of short little practice sessions we're looking for, again, different parts of the house. Okay, now we've desensitized the dog for the triggers. We help the dog practice being alone. Now we're ready to actually start leaving the dog alone. This is the wonderful time of year to do this. I'm not being serious. So you have to bundle up. Basically what you'll do is you'll go outside and the first time you leave, let's say that the door is right here. So the dog's inside, I'm gonna go open the door, go outside, close the door, lock the door, unlock the door, come right back inside and sit down. So first I leave, I mean, I wouldn't even necessarily lock the door the first time. I would just go to the door, open it, close it, wait one second, open it and go back inside and sit down. So when you're watching TV, and you're doing these things, we're not putting the dog to stay. We're not practicing at this point until we've gotten to the point where we can have the dog practice for half an hour away. But every once in a while, you can get up and leave. Now, you don't normally leave your house through your front door, you leave through your garage door. So I would also emulate that, but you might eventually go to the neighbor's house or whatever. So we want the dog just to practice. What we want the dog to know, and this is the, you worked with a, uh, another behaviorist who did kind of a little bit of this, but you didn't help the practice and you didn't have the desensitization. So that's the, that's the steps I think we're missing. Because otherwise, then I just panics when you got it, pace around, and now I'm practicing pacing and being anxious. Now, exercise will help before you do this, but it's not going to fix your problem. It's just going to make it easier. Now, the biggest mistake people get, they go, okay, I'm outside for, now I'm, okay, I'm outside for five seconds before I come back in 10. When they get to like about two minutes, they're like, let's just run to Starbucks really quick. You're going to ruin it. So each trip should be methodically a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Now in California, when I work, people just take their iPad outside and they sit out the back, outside the door. You can use your Wi-Fi, watch TV on whatever it is you want to do. It's Midwest and you work, don't work. Yeah, that's not gonna be an option for you. So just bundle up and go in your car. And eventually you want to do the same thing with your car. You get in your car and open the car door, get in, close the car door, get out and come back inside. So we're gonna recreate the steps that are associated that she can't, that she can't see, but she can hear. Do that several times. And then next time, maybe go in there and open the garage door and close it, but you're not starting the car. So again, we're drilling up all these different things and then you come right back inside. So the whole time we're practicing, helping the dog stay practiced, being calm, and you come back and the end of the world doesn't happen. And eventually get to the point where you can actually sit outside for like a half an hour, 45 minutes, the longest would ever be two hours. But if your dog's in your pacing, if you're seeing drool come down, if the dog has accidents, it starts digging. Those are all indications it's basically having a panic attack. If you do this right, you shouldn't see any of those things. You should see the dog get up and walk around and you can leave bully sticks when you're at this stage and kneecaps and things that you know the dog really likes, the, the anti-rawhide things that you have. If the dog starts chewing those, that's beautiful. That's, if you see grooming, uh, scratching themselves, playing, doing things that they're not, that if you're about to, if I'm about to, if I'm about to be mugged, the last thing I care about is how my hair looks. Well, if I'm on TV, maybe I would. But uh, for the dog, if they're doing grooming and scratching and playing, they're not panicking. They're not freaking out. They've achieved a confidence level. Now, the last little thing I'm going to talk about is not necessarily about uh, uh, about the stay for separation anxiety. It is about uh, building up the dog's confidence. Because a lot of dogs, go ahead and look at it while you're doing this. It's fine. Okay. Put it on your knee. Uh, so basically, um, Dogs with insecurity, it, uh, with, a self, uh, with separation anxiety, have an insecurity. So what I'd like you to do is go to YouTube and try to find some new tricks that you can teach her. I showed you the hand targeting exercise. I have a video for that if you can't remember how to do that, but that's pretty easy. I want you to just practice that. By the end of a week, you should be able to say, from everywhere, go like this, and she runs over and touches her nose to your hand. But then also teach her how to roll over, how to play dead. Roll over and play dead should be caught, taught, simul uh, not simultaneously, but right after each other. They use the same elements. Uh, but teach your dog to go to your fridge and grab you a water, uh, go, you know, to wipe its paws when it comes inside. That's something you can teach a dog to do. That's a little bit more advanced. Picking up your toys and putting them in your kennel or whatever it is. So if you can teach her some new commands, she should know at least 10 commands. Studies show once a dog reaches about 10 commands, it's kind of a tipping point in terms of their confidence level. And so if we can teach her some other things, and some of them should be, uh, you know, uh, utilitarian, but sometimes they're goofy ones. Sometimes I'll just do a dog, teach the dog to do a spin. If the dog's head is here, 
I kind of reach over and hold my arm like this, the dog goes to it, and I just lure the dog all the way around, and I pop a treat in the mouth, and I call it, we call it hurricane. And after I say hurricane, the dog just does a circle. We do this actually, we teach this to dogs who are getting humped in the dog park. It, it's a great way to get the other dog to dismount. Um, so you teach me how to do that. Another one that I have is I have the dog come like this way, and then I cr cross the treat over here, and the dog follows me around. So we teach the dog just to walk or circle around you. My trainer, Julie, actually will walk, and she does it while she has her dog scissoring. So as she walks, she goes like this, the dog walks this way, and she goes this, and the dog, the dog is doing a serpentine through the legs. So that's more of an agility training thing, but there's a lot of things like that that we can do, and just like us as humans, we have more, we learn new things, we have a self-esteem boost, we have a confidence boost, and that helps inoculate us from other things where we can kind of brush it off instead of being really worried about it. Lucy, you want a treat? Let's see if we can get you to come in the shot. See how many treats I have to toss before Lucy comes and gets one. Oh, that was almost on the couch. I'm intentionally throwing it poorly so it's not on the couch. Nope. Well, when you have a dog like this, we want to kind of create a scenario where she can come and good things happen. But if she doesn't want to come, that's fine. One little, last little bonus, I know this is a really long video, but when you have friends come over, she's aloof. Give them all these really good treats and have them just toss it on. Do what I was showing you on the, on the couch. Mm -hmm. As her confidence level gets up, you should see her being able to come and get those and come it. And that is a great indicator for on the couch. We put a, a dotted line of them about every eight inches apart. We see how comfortable she is. What is her line? She makes it real quick because she stops saying treats past that line. So you can kind of use that as a gauge to know how comfortable she is with a guest. And the best thing a guest can do is ignore her. Don't try to look at her. Don't try to talk to her. Just pretend like she's not even there. If she comes to you, if you want to give her a treat, it's best to hold it off to the side like this front facing is confrontational to dogs. But after a while, she's like, approaching Jane is a good thing. I go to her, I get treats, she doesn't pet me, she doesn't look at me, I go away and I come back and forth and eventually she'll be up in Jane's lap snuggling just like she is with you. All right, well, this is a simulate of Lucy who is not coming over to be in the shot. And these are some tips and tricks you can use if you have a dog that suffers from separation anxiety.